We'd like to Beth, thank Beth for being here with us today, and we look forward to hearing from her. Beth Rossica is the Vice President of Business Development for Vision Quest, a nationwide provider of evidence-based services to at-risk youth. She also serves on our Board of Directors uh, for our association, Advancing EVP. Dr. Rossica has worked in the provider community for 20 years, serving youth in the juvenile justice, child welfare, and behavioral health systems. She has assisted her agency in embracing evidence-based practices and has been responsible for selecting and implementing several evidence-based models. Dr. Rossica implements evidence-based programs that are funded by Medicaid and has collaborated with the states and agencies to explore Medicaid funding for these services. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Beth. And I'll just give a few brief instructions to our attendees. Uh, during the webinar, if you need any help, you can send me a question in the question box and I'll respond to your concern. If you have questions, you can type those in and we'll address those here and there at the appropriate time. And we will now turn the time over to Beth. Thank you so much, Beth, for being here. Thank you. It's great to be here. So just let me know, Jennifer, when I have control. Okay. All right. So I think we should be good. Okay. All right, well, good uh, afternoon or good morning to everyone on the call, depending on where you're calling in from. <clears throat> um, I saw the list of attendees uh, prior to today, and I think that there's a number of folks on the call that I know, and I'm looking forward to really having more of a collaborative discussion than just a presentation today. <clears throat> so as Jennifer said, if you have questions or comments, please feel, to set, please feel free to send her a note in the uh, chat box, and we'll... Uh, get your questions answered and then we'll have some time at the end for discussions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the fiscal side of um, implementing evidence-based practices and I think that this is a hot topic across the nation right now um, for a number of different reasons but particularly I think that we've moved past the idea of convincing folks that we need to do evidence-based practices. I think a lot of states and jurisdictions understand that they want to do evidence-based practices. Um, I think more of the issue now is with the implementation of those practices and the funding and how, how these services are funded. <clears throat> because I think a lot of what we've seen over the last couple of years is that there has been um, you know, a much larger implementation of evidence-based practices. However, I think what we're seeing are some real sustainability issues, and I'm going to talk about that um, in a little bit. But sustainability, from my perspective, is one of the biggest issues with implementing evidence-based services, and funding is a huge component of those sustainability issues. So we're going to talk um, primarily about that today, but I'll, I'll review some other basic information uh, for those of you who um, may not be familiar with it. So as I talked uh, just a moment ago, jurisdictions are really more interested in contracting for EBPs, and the conversation is not really about why, but rather about how. And there still exists a wide range and variation of how jurisdictions approach funding for these types of services, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, there are a number of ways that uh, contracting entities can fund evidence-based services. And as a provider, it's extremely important to examine what your cost will be to determine what rate you need to be able to sustain a program. Um, there are a lot of costs associated with doing an evidence-based program. <clears throat> and for new providers getting into this arena, they're often um, not familiar with all of the costs that go into building a successful program. One of the key pieces for those who are familiar with evidence-based programs is that you know that it typically takes at least 6 to 12 months to get to a break-even point um, because of the implementation and the ramp-up time to get um, services filled to get to your full capacity. And as I mentioned, there are providers that fail to sustain evidence-based programs over time because the funding is just not adequate to support the cost. And I think that, again, that's one of the key 
discussion points for today is really understanding what it takes to build a sustainable evidence-based program financially because if you don't have that you won't be able to deliver the clinical services that you're required to do and so from my perspective the fiscal side of funding EBPs is equally as important as the clinical implementation because without um, solid funding um, you can't do a good clinical program. And so those two things are intimately related and go hand in hand from my perspective. In terms of funding for evidence-based programs, um, as I mentioned, different jurisdictions do it different ways. And from my perspective, working at VisionQuest, we have experienced um, most of the options that are on this list. So cost reimbursement is you know, fairly simple. You basically whatever it costs to do your program, the um, contracting entity reimburses you those costs. And when I say whatever it costs, based on a budget, you put together a budget, you say, you know, these are the fees that are associated, the cost for the therapist, the cost for the office space, mileage, you know, cell phone allowances, and certainly the licensing fees from the model developers. Uh, but that's a, a fairly straightforward way that you say, you know, to fund a, a team of you know, FFT for three therapists, it's, you know, $200,000 a year, and you submit invoices and the, the contracting entity reimburses you for that. Um, in my experience, there are not a lot of contracting entities that want to do cost reimbursement. Um, more of the risk is on the contracting entity than it is on the service provider, and so in my experience, that's um, not a, a way that typically people like to fund things Although from a provider perspective, it certainly minimizes the provider's risk and it also um, gives you a good opportunity to start up um, a program because as we know, the ramp up time takes several months to get to full capacity. So that is a nice option, at least in the first year of implementation, to allow everyone to get an understanding of, of the utilization issues and to be able to get through that startup period. Um, under a case rate, this is basically where you say um, it costs us you know, $4,000 per case uh, per child and family, and you contract you know, for that rate. Um, when, when you complete the case, then you are reimbursed at whatever that rate is that you negotiated. So that's a, another way that you can look at doing uh, funding for programs. The session and the weekly rate are really sort of um, follow from the case rate. So sometimes jurisdictions <clears throat> like to pay for a session. So you do an MST session and you get a flat rate. So for every session that you do, you get that same rate. And then a weekly rate is similar to the session rate other than really what that includes is that if you do more than one session, you still get paid the same weekly rate. Um, so sometimes the weekly rates are a little bit higher than session rates to take into account the times when you may do more than one session per week. We've also seen an hourly or a 15-minute rate. Um, oftentimes, we'll talk about Medicaid, you see the 15-minute rate in the uh, Medicaid reimbursement. That's typically how that's done. But uh, we also, VisionQuest also has contracts that are non-Medicaid funded where we're reimbursed at a 15-minute rate or at an hourly rate. Um, we've also had some experience with per diem rates, a daily rate, and um, you know that is a, a rate that you get every single day for the time that uh, the child is in the program. This is probably a, a, a less popular methodology because under the, the primary models, the primary model developers, FFT, MST, um, BSFT or PLL, those types of services, you're not necessarily providing a service every day, and so oftentimes contracting entities are not interested in um, doing a per diem rate to pay a provider for a day of service when they don't actually necessarily receive those services. Funding a therapist, um, VisionQuest has not actually not had experience with this model, but I know other agencies that have where a county or an entity decides that they would like to basically pay the costs for one therapist or three therapists 
and um, you know you put together a budget for what that would cost. So that's similar to cost reimbursement, but it's really more about um, honing in on the specific numbers of kids that you want to serve, and then the county funds that therapist. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about Medicaid reimbursement, which is a um, controversial topic. And it's interesting because over the last, oh, I'm going to say probably seven years, we've seen um, a huge growth and in some places then a contraction of the use of Medicaid funds to support evidence-based programs. And I think that it's obvious why states are interested in using MA funds. With all of the budget crunches that are going on across the country, um, states and counties have less money to provide services, and so they're looking for additional sources to support all the different services that they want to provide. So MA seemed like a great way to um, you know, fund some of these services. It is an entitlement, so the federal government is required to support states um, in terms of their funding levels. And so many states have really looked at using MA funds either primarily or as a supplemental way to fund evidence-based programs. And as I said, it really varies greatly from state to state. Um, different states have approached it in, in a, a variety of ways. Some have had great levels of success and others have not had um, great levels of success. And I'm looking forward to having some discussion at the end of the call today about um, you know, what's been working and what hasn't been working. I think some of our um, folks out in California um, had registered for the um, webinar today, and I'm hoping that they're on and can talk a little bit more about what California is doing, because I actually think that California has a really good handle on how to use Medicaid funds to support evidence-based programs. What we've seen also is that some states really started off really gung-ho about using Medicaid for um, evidence-based services, and then it's really been backed off. Um, I, I am located in the great state of Pennsylvania and um, have done a number of evidence-based programs and continue to do evidence-based programs here in PA under Medicaid funding, but we've seen a lot of struggles here with providers being able to make, um, make the program successful with the level of funding that's been provided through the managed care companies. And so there have been a number of evidence-based program sites that have shut down here in Pennsylvania because they haven't been able to sustain the program fiscally or clinically and have had to make decisions to close programs down. And I think that that's a theme that we're seeing is that when a state doesn't have um, a good comprehensive plan across the board to support evidence-based programs fiscally through Medicaid, it becomes very challenging for providers to be successful. Um, it, there, are, there are discrepancies and there are challenges between the MA regs and model fidelity. So it's definitely not uh, a one-to-one -one match to say let's use Medicaid dollars to fund evidence-based programs. And in many instances, it depends on the state and their Medicaid plan and what service definition they're using to bill under Medicaid. Um, some states have done some interesting things where they've actually created a specific service definition for FFT or MST that is more closely aligned with the model fidelity requirements. In other cases, um, states are using um, behavioral health rehabilitative services as the category under which uh, these services are being billed, or they're simply being billed under the psychiatric outpatient clinic at you know, family therapy um, rates and descriptions. So depending on how the state has set that up really drives how the reimbursement is set and then how, what are the requirements for the program. Um, so it, it is sometimes challenging when you're uh, doing a program under Medicaid funding because there are obviously a lot more requirements for the Medicaid funding in terms of diagnoses and treatment plans that follow symptom, symptom, symptology. Um, so there are a number of issues that go along with that, 
And these, <clears throat> these challenges definitely make it harder for providers to work in this environment. And it actually ends up costing more money uh, to operate an evidence-based program under Medicaid funding simply because of all of the additional requirements. So many times the, what the model developer requires is different from what MA requires for the level of funding. So that there are more requirements under the MA funding that aren't necessarily required from the model developer. So that creates challenges and it also creates um, a, a higher cost. So it, it, for, for VisionQuest, it's definitely more expensive for us to deliver Medicaid-funded FFT than it would non-Medicaid-funded FFT for a couple of reasons. Um, generally, the qualifications of the staff are higher. You um, sometimes need licensed folks to deliver the services where FFT doesn't require that. Um, and actually, FFT charges a higher licensing fee for uh, Medicaid-funded programs because of all of the requirements that go along with that. So it is a challenge um, to work through the Medicaid funding. Not to say that it can't be done, because there are places that it is being done and it's being done well. I mentioned um, California. Uh, the state of Florida right now has, uh, in the midst of changing and trying to draw down Medicaid funding for their um, evidence-based services, and they're you know, looking at a, a service definition that's going to be challenging to be able to um, draw down those dollars with a, a weekly service description. So all of those things create challenges, and like I said, it's not that it can't be done, but um, it does require um, a much higher level of attention to detail, and it really does change some of the implementation and the funding issues. I'll talk briefly about startup costs um, because oftentimes people don't think about this and certainly contracting entities, states or counties, um, most of the time are not interested in providing startup costs for new evidence-based programs. Um, and while there's not a bricks and mortar cost associated like a typical residential program, there are definitely startup costs that are part of the program. Obviously you have to hire, recruit, train your staff before you can actually start providing services. So you have a couple of weeks at least, um, generally six to eight weeks, of ramp up where you're um, interviewing and hiring staff and then setting up the training with the model program to be able to deliver the services and then beginning paying the licensing fees and the travel costs for the trainers. Also meeting with stakeholders and getting buy-in to the program because without that support from your stakeholders, you won't get enough referrals to be able to support uh, your program moving forward. So there are a number of startup costs that are involved, and as I said, there's typically not startup funding, and so programs have to be prepared that they are going to you know, work at a deficit for probably the first year because the, the first two months before you actually deliver services and then probably the four to six months that it takes to get to um, a higher capacity or fuller utilization creates a, you know, a good eight-month period where you're losing money until you're able to you know, get to full capacity. So generally, if you can break even in your first year, you're doing well. I will tell you that in my experience, um, it's usually not until year two that you can get to that point, um, assuming that everything else you know, goes, goes well for you. I think I already kind of covered the points on this slide, but all of the evidence-based programs do have a different cost structure. So, you know, FFT and MST and BSFT and PLL, they all have a pretty similar way of um, contracting with providers in terms of an annual licensing fee that can be paid monthly or quarterly or annually. Um, some of the other evidence-based programs that we haven't really touched upon, things like aggression replacement training or cognitive behavioral therapy, um, those are definitely lesser expensive models to implement, um, but also have a less rigorous level of supervision. And I think, to my knowledge, California might be uh, one of the only states that's actually funding those through Medicaid right now, but we can talk a little bit about that in our discussion at the, at the end of the webinar today. <clears throat> 
Um, and as you, uh, I think everyone on the call here knows that you really have to contract with the evidence-based program to deliver services. So I think I covered all of that. So I want to talk a little bit about marketing because this is an important piece um, for funding evidence-based programs because as we talked earlier, um, the primary way that people are contracting to provide these services is on some sort of session rate or case rate or hourly rate. Um, but at any rate, they all relate back to the number of referrals that you have. So if you don't have enough referrals to support your team, you are not going to be able to be um, financially successful, and you're also not going to be able to be clinically successful. Because what ends up happening is, is that as, you're, as the new therapists are learning this model, if they don't have enough cases to support their practice of learning the new model, they're never going to become proficient. So it's really a double-edged sword. Lack of referrals not only hurts you fiscally, but it also hurts you clinically. And I think that that's really the point that I want to drive home, is that these two things are interrelated. The, the clinical piece and the fiscal piece really go hand in hand. And without one, you don't have the other. Um, so it's really, I think, important to understand that. Um, and if you don't have enough referrals quickly, um, you're, you're supporting all of these staff, and A, they don't have anything to do, and B, you're not bringing in enough revenue to be able to support the model. The other challenge is, is that most of the models that we work with have a, a requirement for a team. So it's not like you can just start with one therapist and then as your referrals ramp up, you can add more therapists. You have to start with three or five or whatever the model dictates. And if you don't have enough referrals, you know, you're paying for five people that, you know, maybe each have, you know, two cases, which is not very um, fiscally prudent, um, which leads to, you know, significant losses quickly. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, um, one of your startup pieces is really to work with the referral agencies and stakeholders prior to implementation of the service to make sure that everybody's going to buy in. Because oftentimes the decision makers about wanting evidence-based practices are not the same people who are making the referrals to the services. So for example, you might have a county who um, considers itself to be very progressive and wants to adopt these evidence-based practices, yet their line staff probation officers, who are the ones making the referrals, are not bought in, they like their local homegrown accountability program better, <clears throat> and they don't want to make the referrals to, to FFT or MST or BSFT. So that becomes a challenge as well, so that even though you've made good contacts with the, the head people within the county, it's really establishing that relationship and convincing the local level POs, the line staff who are making the referrals, um, the benefit of the services and why it's important to refer to, to the program. Um, another a big piece of marketing is really hiring sound clinicians who are able to market the program. If you don't have good quality staff that can sell the service, um, you're not going to get referrals. So again, this goes back to the idea of matching with your clients, If you know, depending on the population of kids that you're serving, um, hiring folks that are culturally re relevant um, to the community that you're working with, because again, if the, if the purchasing agency is not convinced that you can deliver the services, you're not going to get the you know, referrals going the way that you need to. Another piece with marketing is, is that you typically need some sort of administrative staff, whether it's a director of the program or an administrative assistant, depending on the size and scope of what you're doing. But oftentimes, clinicians are not the best marketers, um, and they're not the best uh, folks to go out and sell the program. So sometimes you need someone to really drive that process, and that's another one of those costs that is not always um, thought about as you're getting ready to get started. So I do want to spend some time um, really talking about these sustainability issues because I think that while all of the other information that I've covered so far is relevant and is important, I think that sustainability is really where we're at right now in the field. As I've said, we've seen an explosion of more and more places using EVPs, wanting to use EVPs, but we're also seeing that 
while there's an increase, there's also um, in certain jurisdictions a decrease because programs have not been able to sustain the services um, that they've been asked to do. As I talked earlier, if you're not funded adequately, you're going to experience quality issues. Um, in today's day and age, with the economy being the way that it is, um, all provider agencies are being asked to do more for less money, and they're being squeezed tighter and tighter. And so there isn't the sort of room for margin that used to exist that providers could have a higher tolerance to say, well, we can start this at a loss, and as long as at this point in time we're not losing money anymore, we can make this work. And what we're seeing is, is that providers have a smaller and smaller tolerance for that window simply because of um, you know, the profitability or the um, losses that they're experiencing within the rest of the agency. That dynamic has really um, been shifting over the past couple of years. One of the other big issues is that when you don't have a, a, a well-funded EVP, you're going to have a much higher potential for model drift and lack of adherence to fidelity. So that if the agency is focused on fiscal issues, so the, the staff are being asked to um, manipulate or um, stretch the model in ways to make it work for financial reasons, then model, um, model adherence becomes much more challenging. Um, so for example, there are some service definitions that states use for a weekly rate, um, which is usually under that intensive in-home community service definition. Um, I'll give you an example in the state of North Carolina VisionQuest had looked at implementing FFT under, and they wanted to do it under Medicaid, um, and we were asked to take a look at the intensive in-home community service definition, and it requires two therapeutic sessions a week and one case management session a week. And when we looked at it, we knew that we couldn't maintain model fidelity and um, do the model the way that it was supposed to be done under that service definition. So ultimately, we were unable to provide the service in that context because we knew that we there some weeks you don't need two therapeutic sessions, and there's typically not a separate case management session with FFT. So that was a case of looking at you know sort of round hole, square peg, that the state really wanted to find a way to fund this through Medicaid, but we really couldn't come to terms with them about how to make that work. And we knew that it would be a challenge for us both clinically with FFT to meet their standards, but also to meet the Medicaid requirements under that service definition. And so we opted that we would not proceed under that service definition. But that's some of the challenges that if a provider were to say, yes, I'll try to make it work this way, that you're going to have a conflict between what the clinical expectations are and what the fiscal realities are. So you're going to have your, your agency saying, you know, we can't lose this much money every month. We've got to make sure that we're able to draw down the full amount of funding available, and yet the model developer may be saying there's no clinical reason for having two therapeutic sessions in this particular week. So it definitely creates friction between um, that clinical side and that fiscal side. One of the other issues that um, I have been seeing over the last couple of years is that uh, more and more providers want to get into the evidence-based game um, because they see that that's the direction that jurisdictions are going. And when competitive solicitations come out, some of these less experienced providers are really underbidding experienced providers to secure contracts at lower rates. Um, part of that is, I think, because they just don't have the experience providing evidence-based services, and so they don't know about all of the different costs that we've talked about. Um, I also think that um, in some instances they do understand, but they want an opportunity to get their foot in the door, so they're willing to underbid and you know, do this at a loss for a period of time to be able to establish some credibility with the hope that maybe they can renegotiate those rates. 
but oftentimes what we see with that are poor outcomes. So that an inexperienced EBP provider, it could take them three years to get to the point where they're at you know, complete model adherence and utilization, whereas a more experienced EBP provider can really get there in a year. So there is a big difference in terms of contracting with an experienced EBP and a less experienced EBP provider. Um, but oftentimes people are just looking at the lowest cost, who's willing to do it for the cheapest, not necessarily thinking through these issues and the potential for you know, poor outcomes. So I wanted to um, spend a little bit of time um, talking about different states and um, how they're utilizing um, evidence-based services and how they're funding those services. And I really um, hope that if there are folks on the call from the different states that I have listed or if there are state folks on the call from other states, I would really like some collaborative um, interaction. And I'm going to actually pause for a moment now because I've now been talking for 30 minutes straight to see if anybody has any questions or comments they'd like to make before we move into some of the state-specific scenarios. So I think that if you want to make a, a um, if you want to ask a question or a comment, you can type it in that little chat box on your screen. Okay, well, I guess we'll keep going. And if you uh, have comments or questions as we're going, please feel free to type them in your little chat box there. So I talked a little bit about Pennsylvania at the beginning of the call. And as I said, I actually live here in Pennsylvania and work here, so I spend a lot of time understanding the way that evidence-based services are, are operating here in the state. Um, one of the big issues that Pennsylvania has had is not only with the Medicaid funding, but with some of the rural areas. Um, and we've seen a lot of evidence-based uh, providers in rural areas have to close down because they just weren't able to make things work fiscally or clinically. Um, when you have people spread out in, in such large geographic distances, your caseloads you know, can't be as high as what you could do in a large city. And so the rates in rural areas really require um, a bit more money to be able to support the services simply because of the large geographic distances that therapists have to cover. Pennsylvania is an interesting state. We have you know, two large cities at either end and then you know, very, very rural in the middle of the state and particularly in the northern middle part of the state. So that, that has been a challenge in Pennsylvania is how to balance out you know, all of those rural issues versus what the urban issues are. I've already talked a little bit about some of the Medicaid challenges here in Pennsylvania. And what makes Pennsylvania um, even more challenging from a Medicaid reimbursement perspective is that there's a number of different managed care companies in Pennsylvania. So each county chooses the managed care company they want to um, take care of their processing. And there are actually five different managed care companies in Pennsylvania. And each managed care company sets different rates um, for their providers. And in some instances, you could have a managed care company that gives different rates to different providers. So there's been a wide variation in the way that um, evidence-based programs have been funded across the state. Another challenge that has been encountered is while the goal is to have the majority of these evidence-based services funded by Medicaid, there are always kids who need the services that are either not Medicaid eligible, whose family has private insurance, or whose eligibility lapses in the middle of, um, in the, middle of the treatment, uh, the therapy that they're receiving. And so what ends up happening is, is that oftentimes there are kids that can't be covered by Medicaid and the provider ends up providing those services for free unless the county is willing to pick up those costs. So that's been some of the challenge here in Pennsylvania with making all of the different Medicaid funding work. Um, even given that, though, there are still a number of agencies that are providing evidence-based services. Um, FFT and MST are you know, two of the largest services that are being provided in Pennsylvania. Um, there's also 
um, a number of other services that are being provided. Pennsylvania has an epicenter that you know puts out their list of sort of approved evidence-based practices. So there are a number of different models that are being used in Pennsylvania, but there certainly have been some um, challenges, especially regarding the rural areas and the Medicaid reimbursement. Um, down in the state of Maryland, they've actually um, sort of been at the forefront of implementing evidence-based practices um, for quite some time now. Um, VisionQuest has a few FFT sites in the state of Maryland, um, and there are other evidence-based services that are also being implemented in Maryland. Um, there, as a state, um, they have things set up where providers contract directly with the state for specific geographic regions where they determine the needs to be. And they're actually using, and I don't even know if I listed this, they're doing a monthly rate. So it's really based on a case rate, but then paid in a monthly installment. And that, that also is, a, um, I think, a really nice way to fund, fund services and seems to work well for providers. Um, Maryland has not moved in the direction of Medicaid funding as of yet, although I know that they have been looking at that. Um, and I will tell you as a provider, it is much easier to implement evidence-based practices in a non-Medicaid environment than it is in a Medicaid environment. It's not that it's impossible, it's just there's a lot less paperwork and bureaucracy that goes along with doing it in a non-Medicaid environment. Um, Florida is another interesting place. Um, the Redirections Project has been in operation down there for many, many years. Um, EBA, Evidence-Based Associates, had been um, managing that project for a long time and doing a really nice job with uh, contracting with providers to do all sorts of evidence-based services, including FFT and MST and PLL and BSFT, so a number of different services across the state. And the state is now in the process of changing that model where they're contracting directly with providers and also, again, looking at Medicaid funding to support those programs. Um, and there are definitely some issues that are accompanying that transition um, as, as we speak right now. So it will be interesting to see how all of that plays out over the next year or so. Um, I think I mentioned North Carolina. Previously, uh, North Carolina is an interesting state because it has a specific service definition for MST. That's the only evidence-based program that they have a separate service definition for. So there are um, a, a high number of MST sites in the state of North Carolina, but because there's not a similar service definition for other models like FFT or BSFT, um, there are really not many of those other kinds of evidence-based programs, blueprint MOOC programs, being implemented in North Carolina. So that's another example where um, the Medicaid funding has successfully been used to support MST, but not any of the other um, model programs that are out there. Um, Arizona, the way that Arizona has dealt with funding EBPs uh, through Medicaid is to do it under an outpatient clinic definition. So you have to have an outpatient clinic license and then you're able to um, provide those services through your outpatient clinic under their existing family therapy rates, which are not necessarily high enough to really support um, full model fidelity and full model adherence. California, as I mentioned, and I said I'm hoping that our friends from California are on the line, they, I think, have done a really nice job of funding not just some of the big blueprint programs through Medicaid, but some of the other um, evidence-based programs like uh, aggression replacement training and cognitive behavioral therapy. And I think that they have a really nice balanced infrastructure where training for the model programs is done um, on a statewide basis and um, contracting with counties is done you know, between the provider and the specific county um, to be able to draw down those Medicaid funds. So today, I would say that I think California may be the best example for how Medicaid funding is being used successfully to fund um, a number of different evidence-based initiatives. Are any of our uh, friends from California on the line that would like to make a comment? 
I'm not seeing any raised hands yet, but we'll give them a, a chance to respond. Thanks, Jennifer. And while we're waiting for California to join in, if they're on, um, I'm also curious if there are folks from other states. I think that we had some of our friends from Louisiana that had signed up for the webinar today. I'm curious if there's anybody else out there that would like to speak specifically to what's going on within their state that they'd like to share with the group today. Okay, it looks like maybe David, let's try, let me try to unmute him. Hi, David. I don't know if you can, can you hear me and you can reply? Did you have a question? Um, pardon me, it's more a comment. I think that in addition to some of the vulnerabilities that Beth has uh, laid out very eloquently, <clears throat> pardon me, we, um, what we've experienced in in recent months has been um, a, a different kind of uh, threat to sustainability and that has to do with when you have your funding all in in one generally speaking in one funding source much as is the case in sort of our personal uh, finances when you know uh, anybody worth their salt says you need to diversify um, we have had a, a system in New Mexico that I think really has been a uh, just just a, a, a wonderful poster child for how to do Medicaid with specifically MST. It hasn't been utilized the way Beth talked about California using Medicaid for a diversity of evidence-based programs. Um, so what's happened is that because everything for MST has been funded through Medicaid, when you have anything that comes down that really impacts that single funding source, and again in this case we're talking about Medicaid, uh, it, it really, really provides a, a, a major threat to the sustainability of the programs. And uh, that's what happened largely around the Medicaid audit in the state. Um, so. Uh, again, it isn't so specific to Medicaid, but when you look at all the challenges that Beth talked about from her experience, uh, and you add to that that additional kind of vulnerability that you can be exposed to, um, you, you have what I've kind of referred to as this uh, unpla unpredicted tsunami that then gets overlaid to other things involving Medicaid and managed care when you know, uh, uh, we're having in New Mexico, in addition to all of the changes in the provider landscape now, we're also having, um, uh, going from a single MCO to a four different MCOs effective in six weeks. And that was more uh, known about and planned for, but um, it, it demonstrates some of the difficulty in this day and age, and particularly if you're funding, these are you know all related to Medicaid again, because there are four MCOs who have contracts with the state, similar to what Beth described as is the case, for instance, in Pennsylvania. The difference is that in Pennsylvania, it's county specific, which MCO is involved, whereas in New Mexico, in the name of consumer choice, you can literally have four people on one block mm -hmm. within any community who choose four different MCOs in terms of each one choosing a different one. So uh, I'm only I'm saying that because again um, there are real challenges in in funding and particularly when you have a single funding source and when that single funding source is Medicaid. Thanks, David. That was, um, I really appreciate you sharing that information. I was not aware of that um, scenario in New Mexico where uh, consumers will have choice with their managed care company. I can't imagine the havoc that that will wreak in terms of behavioral health services. So it will be interesting to see how all of that plays out. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And I do think that you touched upon in a really important topic in terms of this issue of single funding source because particularly in today's um, 
tumultuous fiscal environment, I don't think that we can count on any single funding source um, being around forever. I think that even Medicaid at some point will be vulnerable, and I don't think that it will necessarily continue in the same way that it has you know, up to this point in time. So I think that as we look at funding these services, I do believe that it has to be a balance of mixed funding sources. Because as we know, you know, Medicaid only provides, only pays for direct service time. And with these models, there are a number of other activities, whether it's, you know, driving to get to see the family in their home or completing assessments or completing case notes, whatever the supervision with the model developer, all of those things are not compensable under Medicaid, but they're required under the model. And so I think that blended funding streams protect everybody. Um, so a portion being funded through Medicaid, portions being funded through counties or states, um, looking at multiple funding options makes really, really good sense. And I don't think that we've seen a good model for that across the country up to this point in time. Um, so I really appreciate you raising both of those issues because I do think that they're very important to the conversation. And just one other quick thing, uh, Beth, that <clears throat> what's critical, and that's pretty much what's been on my plate these last couple of months, is when, again, you're talking about a single funding source of Medicaid, you've got to, it, you've got to really deal with then the issue of non-reimbursable activities being required to do the models that you just referred to. And if it's single source, then you have to be able to negotiate a rate that for what is billable that in basically incorporates what is not billable. And Absolutely. that depends on an understanding and a commitment from the managed care organization to provide the model that you're, you're choosing. Yes, I think that you've hit the nail on the head precisely. And I alluded to that fact earlier in terms of inexperienced EBP providers because they don't always understand all of the requirements that go along so that they think that they can deliver the service for much less expensive than what it really does take to do it successfully, both from a clinical and a financial standpoint. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. And you better mute me now before I say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for jumping in. I appreciate it. Do we have other, um, other questions or comments? We're, we have about 10 minutes left in our time, and I'd be happy to um, have other discussions or take any questions or comments. I'm still looking out for those raised hands. I think everyone's been feeling a little shy, maybe, but we can give them a few minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, as we were discussing today, I mean, I think that I think that the environment is much more conducive today to um, accepting and acknowledging that evidence-based practices are the way that we want to go. But I think that we still have a really long distance before we're at the point where we're funding these programs at a level that is acceptable. And I think part of it is just convincing people that it does cost more. Evidence-based programs cost more. There's no shame in that. There's nothing to be afraid of with that. They cost more. But they cost more because you get more. You get better outcomes. And so, you know, that's always the approach that, that I try to take when I'm talking with folks is that, yes, there's no question that it's going to be more expensive, but you're going to get more bang for your buck and more return on your investment, um, uh, you know, by investing in these types of programs. And I think that as a provider, I think part of what the challenge is is having the guts to walk away from scenarios that you know you can't make work. So when a jurisdiction is asking you to do a program for um, less money than you need to make it be viable, I think you have to have the guts to say, no, I can't do that. I want the business, I need the business, but I know that fiscally and clinically I can't make this program work, so I'm going to have the courage to walk away. And I think that until more providers are really willing to do that, to stand up and say, no, we won't do this, um, I think that we're going to continue to have this struggle because as long as funders can find someone that says, I'll do it for that amount, 
um, they're always going to give that a try until they get burned enough times that they see that they're not getting the outcomes that they're looking for. So that's some of the mantra that I really try to talk to people about is really understanding what the costs are and not underselling you know, your agency because you won't be able to get the kinds of outcomes that in, you know you could if it was done correctly. So Jennifer, does it look like we have anyone else that wants to say anything? Not at this time. Okay. All right. Well, then I think that I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. It's always nice to end 10 minutes early, especially for those on Eastern time that are it's, it's in the middle of your lunch hour. I really appreciate um, the folks who joined us today, and thank you, David, for your comments. And if you have any questions or would like to um, follow up, um, you can get in touch with Jennifer, and she can provide you with my contact information. So thank you again for your time, and Jennifer, I'll turn it back to you for any closing comments. Thank you, Beth. You did a great job. I'm going to launch a poll real quick, so everyone have a look, and I'll give you a few minutes to respond to each question. Just two more questions. Thanks for your patience. Great. That concludes our poll. And thanks again, everyone, for being with us. Um, if you like what you heard today, which looking at the polls, you, you did, you loved it, um, and you'd like to share this information with some of your colleagues, you can visit our website in the next couple of weeks, and you can find a recorded version of today's webinar there. That's at www.advancingebp.org. And make sure you join us next month in December for our webinar on implementation. That will be on the 20th. Have a great week, or oh, weekend, I guess. Thank you.